When it comes to Fred Blassie, do you think people really appreciate how big a star he was, not just in L.A., but Atlanta? He was one of the biggest stars in Atlanta for years. I mean, they, I think Watts brought him back when he was booking there in like the late 70s even. Yeah, well, a show. no, nobody does understand how, how big he was because he was around for so long, but also so much of it was before television and, and you know, videotape. And it's said, well, before television, but you know what? Well, he was, he was around before television, but I mean, before videotape and, and the modern shit people see, but no, he was for what 15 years, he was just a journeyman, as they used to say. Uh, you know, guy on the card, dark hair, uh, you know, especially in the Midwest, because he was, you know, around St. Louis, he worked a lot. He was here in Louisville a lot in the 40s and, and early 50s. And, but then by the time when he went to Atlanta in the 50s and bleached his hair and became a really strong heel and television helped him because he could fucking talk because Freddie was he wasn't glib. Like some people say, I am with the vocabulary and the one-liners and the blah, 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 blah. But he had that gift of bullshit because he was a smooth ladies' man type. He always had a, he always prided himself on being a ladies' man and had a line for them and had a line just from hanging out with guys and fucking being in the business for so long and he'd heard so much bullshit. And that's it. It came naturally to him. So he could cut the fucking promos. And he didn't mind going on TV in Los Angeles and telling the people that he'd heard all about these women. It's nothing like the fucking women he's heard about. That they're all pigs and they're cows and they wear potato sacks. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, they're all ugly. Nobody did that back then. So not only Atlanta, he was huge in the 50s to, to the point where they were. And then later on in the 60s, when he had to quit wrestling in the 60s for what, a year and a half? He had one of his kidneys taken out. Uh, he had a car lot in Atlanta, sold cars and they advertised in the, in the wrestling program, but everybody in town knew who Fred Blassie was. So they'd come and buy a car from him, but he didn't like selling cars. So he came back and, you know, with one kidney, but, uh, in LA, he was huge because of that local television and, and some of those stand up interviews with Jewel Strongbow, the matchmaker, not the, not the wrestler, um, you know, are just hilarious for their time because everybody else back then was so bland because the interview was still new and a lot of the guys were new at it. But fucking Blassie's just tearing people up. And uh, the only reason that he left California, he was still the fucking top babyface in 1973, but the commission wouldn't relicense him because he was past 55. And he was still the top babyface in the territory. It couldn't hardly do anything, but they just fed people to him and he bit them, punched them, kicked them, and made them bleed and beat them. Yeah, you know, Tolis Blasty is one of those matches I wish I could see, even though I know as a classic wrestling match, it was probably the worst match of all time. <laughs> John Tolis yeah. against Blasty in 72 is probably awful, but I probably would have well, well, really enjoyed you, it. You know what? Tolos then was still... He, Tolos was an incredible worker. John Tolos was one of those guys that... All of his work was good and solid. Nothing was spectacular, but everything was, looked good and was sharp. And he was, all, you know, he and his brother Chris were a tag team and, and had had, you know, quite a bit of success at places, but he'd never been a main event guy. And he could talk. He could cut to promo, which was what L.A. at that point, the territory was more geared to anyway, was talking him in. He could do that. Um, he just... it. it, it if it hadn't been for as over as Blassie was and the the shocking nature of the angle where Tolos blinded him and the, the way that they carried it out, it was the right place, right time. But I guarantee it, Tolos' work was fine. He, his work matched up with, you know, most people. It just that there was, and, and his promo, it just the look or whatever, it never clicked anywhere else except in that particular spot with it, with a guy that was over his God like Blassie. When it comes to the promos, you would know probably better than most. Isn't the story, although Muhammad Ali gave credit to Gorgeous George, it was probably Fred Blassie that was actually the promos he was watching that influenced yes. the way he talked? Yeah, because, well, and, and, and in part, and of course there was a lot of, I think it, 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 the wrestling promos, first of all, with Ali influenced more 
the concept of what he did rather than the exact verbiage because the the rhyming shit blasted or george neither one rhymed but it, it some of that was some of old southern bullshit little tom boogaloo shaft uh some southern baptist preacher stuff the black church uh but the the story that ali told always was that he had uh he had done a radio show promoting one of his first fights where was it vegas and he, the wrestlers came in and, and one of the wrestlers cut this promo and just basically just annihilated verbally his opponent and said all this shit and everything. And they drew a bigger crowd in town than, than Ali's fight. And then later on, he would say that it was gorgeous George. Um, but then, but not, no, and we should just say gorgeous George, one of the most, over gimmicks ever and one of the most influential wrestlers ever not necessarily known as one of the great talkers of all time well but also ali didn't turn pro until after he won the 1960 olympics right the gold medal in the olympics by then george was drunk and on the way out of the business he was huge earlier but las vegas in those days could have been a spot show from the los angeles territory and the point is, is that years later, when Fred Blassie was a manager in the WWF, Vince McMahon Jr. Uh, and the WWF, uh, WWF then helped co-promote the Ali Inoki closed circuit extravaganza in 76. And Vince gave Blassie, uh, put Blassie in the situation as a manager to try to talk up and do some publicity. And Ali said, no, wait, you're that guy. You're that guy. You're the guy that I fucking heard. And Blassie was always, you know, impressed by that, that he said that. But then, because Gorgeous George was a more mainstream wrestling name than Fred Blassie, when Ali went back to telling the story, he started crediting Gorgeous George again. Here's what I think. I think it was Blassie because Blassie was from St. Louis, especially during the, if if Ali was born as I believe he was in 1942-ish, one-ish, two-ish. Fred Blassie would have been the guy doing television in Louisville, Kentucky uh, in the in the early 1950s. Both, here's the thing, Louisville had wrestling from Chicago on, but also there were intermittent local wrestling programs through the 50s. And definitely Blassie appeared a number of times, as I just said, in Louisville Live in the 40s and 50s. Gorgeous George appeared here too, but Gorgeous George never called his opponents names or did that blah, blah, blah. So I think that probably Ali had seen Blassie more than he had seen Gorgeous George and just took a little bit from everybody because really neither one of them sounded like I'm a float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Joe Frazier, you better test your endurance. You're going to need more insurance, whatever the fuck. And, you know, so it was just the idea of trash talking that Ali got from professional wrestling, of hyping the fight, of never breaking character, or not breaking it except when, whenever you can't help it, and of, of you know, trash talking your opponent and, and hyping the fight, which is old as the hills, but he saw it from wrestling. Because it, especially in those days in boxing and pro boxing, they were trying to be of a higher moral ground and didn't condone that type of thing, especially from these uppity young Negro athletes, as he would have been called in the late fifties and early sixties doing that. What he what he was called later on when he began doing it. So he took it from wrestling. I don't know that he took any of it other than the concept from any one particular person is what I'm saying. And it's funny too, because then the Ali promo would go on and influence wrestling because Billy Graham would steal from that and then Dusty would steal from Billy Graham and it would work its way back through professional wrestling from wherever Ali got it from. But see also original Fred Blassie. Also Billy Graham stole it from because he was a fucking evangelist preacher in his younger days before wrestling. And that's where Tom Boogaloo Shaft got it because of the black church services in Mississippi, which is so it's 
you know, there's a level of influence in all of that. And the, the people who were special were the people who took the idea, but gave it their own twist. With Blassie, the other interesting thing about him being with Ali for the 76 match with Anoki is it was a big deal in Japan because we talk about Blassie being yeah. a major star in California and Atlanta. He was massively over as one of the big opponents of Ricky Dozan, sharpening his teeth in Japan. So they knew him already. Having him with Ali against Anoki was a big deal. Yeah, it was like, and, and the the story, which was magnified over the years, legitimately when Blassie made his his first run in, in Japan and was on television, even in the black and white days, and he had sharpened the teeth and they called him a vampire and he bites the head of one of the Japanese guys and he starts bleeding and they get to close up. Some old man had a heart attack and died watching Fred Blassie and it made the papers. So by, you know, by the time Blassie was finished with it, it was a hundred <laughs> people had a heart attack and died, you know? Yeah. But, and that was on network television and those high ratings at the time. Cause in Japan at that point, there was like, maybe there was with their two stations. Right. So everybody saw the fucking thing anyway. And yeah, like you said, then almost 20 years later, there comes the vampire that killed these Japanese citizens, according to legend and lore, the shock of seeing him and his brutality. And he is managing the, you know, the most famous boxer in the world against our hero, Antonio Inoki. It meant more in Japan than it did here, as you said. 